Ralph Einstein, it's great to have you on the show. Uh, how are you, mate? I'm very well, thank you. And you? Uh, there's so much to talk about uh, with your career, but I think the best place to start right now is with uh, your most recent film, the folk horror Lord of Misrule uh, came out on video on demand in December just last year. Um, tell us a little bit about the story. Give, give, a, give, us, give us a brief synopsis of what this is about. So Tuffins Middleton um, plays a young vicar who arrives in this uh, quirky but quaint looking um, English village um, with lots of uh, quirky, quaint neighbours. And during the Harvest Festival, Kind of thing, which is you know slightly pagan, but uh, just looks like a you know, a quaint and quirky village. Um, and then her daughter goes missing uh, that evening, and you suddenly dive into the village and the customs and the rituals of the village, and it becomes clear that it's not quaint and quirky, really. It's really quite dark. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I think that's about as as far as I can go without spoiling, as it were. Yeah. No, I appreciate that. Um, I'm going to do the same with my questions. Try and avoid spoilers. So tell me when this first landed on your radar. I obviously know you've worked with the director, um, William Brent Bell, before. So did you get a script? Uh, was it a meeting? Did you start talking about this when you worked together on Brahms, The Boy 2? No, it was a really odd one. Um, I'd had to pull out of a film in Canada. And Brent was in London starting to prep for The Lord of Misrule. And uh, he came to me with the script. He actually came to my local pub. And uh, he'd, he'd sent me the script the day before, sorry, and I'd, I'd read it. And I couldn't see any part because the Jocelyn part was originally written as a woman, as a 70-year-old woman. Uh, so when I read the script, I was like, it's great. You know, have fun doing that. But <laughs> there's kind of nothing for me in there. I was too old to be the, the husband or anything like that. So I was like, well, you know, what do you want me to do? Uh, and he said, no, I've got this idea that you could play Jocelyn. And so I went, okay. So I went and then reread it and thought about it again. And yeah, it turned out to be quite an interesting, interesting choice to, um, to take a character originally written as a woman and, uh, play it, you know, pretty much word for word and just as gesture as it was originally written. It just comes over very differently when it's a, you know, kind of, I look about 60, I suppose, in the movie, uh, a 60-year-old, six-foot-three bloke uh, rather than a tiny little 70 year old woman. So, yeah, it just adds an extra layer of kind of oddness. You know, the, the character's a bit very dark. He's got a lot of kind of painful history of uh, losing a child of his own, of being a widower and all that. So there's a, there's a real darkness to him, as one of the characters refers uh, in the film. So, um, yeah. Um, I think he was described as sympathetic and repulsive at the same time. So <laughs> I'm kind of wow. kind of proud of that. I'm kind of pull, proud of pulling that one up. I mean, he does seem like a, a fascinating character for you to inhabit. This this patriarch of this village. He's steeped in let's call them the old ways. And I certainly mm. don't think I've heard the line. Would you like some tea? ever said with quite so much menace i mean tell me yeah. you you had fun saying that it looks it looks oh, yeah. like you had fun no i had uh, i had a blast doing it um because i have worked with work running with, uh, with brent before um it was great fun on set is that's always our um yeah and the character was endless fun to just you know try stuff with because if you're just trying to freak people out it's very easy to just kind of scream and shout and dominate people, but there's a there's something more interesting in the fragility of people like that. I think, um, mm, although I'm I, not I, quite I'm not quite sure I back Brent's decision to have uh, full front well, not full rear nudity. <laughs> but <laughs> mine, when, I, when I saw it, I was like, mate, did you really have to? I didn't think my ass was out. <laughs> so yeah, that was a, a bit of a shock when I saw it. So I apologise to all of you in public when you see that. That's that's Brent's decision, not mine. Yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, it's. It feels like you know it's important for the role because you know we have these ideas, don't we? I mean, this country has such a, a, a rich history of folk horror uh, in film. I mean, you know, you go back to the likes of The Wicker Man and uh, and Witchfinder General to more recent films like Alex Garland's Men or Ben Wheatley's In the Earth. 
did you did you do a crash course in, in looking at sort of uh, what we put on screen before in terms of folk horror cinema? I mean, I've I've always been a fan of of the kind of genre, like you say, going back to Wicker Man and Witch Finder General and all those kind of things. Um, and I've also kind of worked a lot in that kind of stuff over the last 10 years. Uh, so, yeah, you do, I don't know, you do kind of feel constantly connected to the world of spooky. <laughs> yeah, well, we're going to talk about uh, one of those movies in particular in just a moment. But um, you and I were both born in the same place. You were born in Leeds as well, weren't you? I was indeed, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And did you spend a lot of time there before you, you left? No. It's a wonderful city. It is. I mean, I go, I go back for football more than anything else, to be honest. Uh, most of my family lived there, but me and my parents moved out to New York when I was a kid. So, yeah, I grew up um, around there, really. But, yeah, born in Leeds. Because while Leeds is obviously not a, a small village community like the, the village of Barrow in um, in Lord <laughs> of Misrule, there's plenty of villages on the outskirts of Leeds. I went I went to a school called Boston Spa in the, right yeah. out of Leeds. And there's mm. like there's there's a million villages around there which have that feel that I didn't grow up around, which is that sort mm. of curtain twitching, you know, yeah. small community, those smiles mm. where you don't really know what's going on behind them. You, I, I'm sure yeah. you've had a similar experience. Absolutely, yeah. I grew up in a, in a in a few different villages around the kind of around North Yorkshire, and yeah, you've always got that feeling, you know, with the local pub and the post office and just the the. the claustrophobic nature of places like that. Yeah, they kind of bring a horror all of their own. They do. They really do. Yeah. They really do, which is why, I, I, you know, this this town that um, has been painted in Lord of Misrule is really interesting. And also, I don't know how much you... I, I've been down a bit of a wormhole, Ralph, I'll be honest, because I didn't realise how much of this is actually based on real-life history of this mm. country, the Lord of Misrule. This is a real yeah. title that was given to people. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. It was uh, yeah, it stopped by Queen Victoria, I think, outlawed it. But it was very much a you know, a commoner would be, you know, bestowed the title as like the leader of all this revelry which used basically meant going round and demanding food and drink from people and all of this kind of stuff. It was like craziness. Between Christmas and New Year, I think. Um so yeah, it's it's all there. It's... And you touched on this a minute ago because I, I did prefix my list of uh, folk horror by saying British folk horror, but arguably uh, one of the greatest folk horrors in recent memory is Robert Eggers' The Witch. Um, talk me through becoming part of that wonderful, terrifying picture. When, when did you first meet Robert? Um, I first met him over... Um over Zoom or whatever the equivalent was back then um, and talked to him about it. And it was, it was strange because I was at a, at a point in my career where I was you know, going to be doing decent kind of small roles in, in good, good quality films. But uh, and then I got this script too, which was for your consideration. And that was a, um, a term I'd kind of never heard before, you know, it's usually I go, right, that's the script, that's the part, do you want to play it or not? Oh, that's the script. You're going to audition for it to see if you know. Uh, and so I got the script, and it was you know the main picture, the kind of uh, the adult lead, I suppose, of the film. And it was amazing, and I was just really confused by it. I was really like, kind of, what? Like, did you mean to send it to Ray Fines or what? <laughs> it was so, it really was genuinely confusing, and it kind of almost annoyed me because it was so great. And I loved it so much when I got the script that I was just immediately annoyed that I would never get to do it. I just assumed that I just, it was like one of those ones where you go, oh, yeah, great. Well, there's someone will have great fun doing that, but it's not going to be me. <laughs> so I really, I really did. And then my agent kind of rang me up after the new year and said, oh, so what did you think? And I went, what? She went, that, that's the script that you've been almost offered. And I'm like, oh, I like, didn't realize they were that serious about it. So then I, I met with Robert and, uh, eventually got properly cast and approved by um, the people who put the money in. And then when he was over, in, he came over to London to do the casting for the, all the other characters. So I got to, for the first time, be on the other side of the, of the casting process. So I'd probably sat with Robert and reading the scenes in with, with all the other characters. So, you know, it was the first time I got to be 
really creatively you know involved in a film to that extent it was great that's amazing that must be um that must be a, a nice experience, both because you are no longer auditioning, but also for those people auditioning in the room that you're reading with. Because while you have the part at that point, having another actor and having gone through that process yourself, there must be a certain amount of empathy in terms of helping them give the best performance where, rather than just being faced with some behind the scenes casting people. Yeah, I think I think that, that added to it, definitely. Um, especially with the kids as well, because... Uh, I used to be a drama teacher, and I did a, quite a lot of youth drama. So I, you know, I like working with kids, uh, and I think you, you, know, you get the most amazing performances out of young actors because they're working off instinct; it's not not calculated. So that can work amazingly for film. So yeah, it was really nice to to be able to cast the or help cast the younger characters as well. It was good. And was it immediately obvious in the room when? Um... And you Taylor Joy auditioned. Was it clear from from the get go that this was something special? Here, she was something special. This this this, this was exactly right for the film. Well, you see, I'm all I'll, ever from the start of the process of the film. I, for some reason, was absolutely convinced it was going to be really good. Just there was no doubt in my mind, um, and that continued all the way through. And it kind of you know, used to annoy like Kate Dickey and Rob sometimes when I'll be kind of, you know, just don't worry about it, it's fine, it's going to be great. Um, and uh, it's all the way through, but, but one thing that I have to admit I got wrong was uh, the final two that we auditioned for uh, the, the role were an actress called Molly Windsor, who's a fantastic actress, who's done lots of great stuff in the last 10 years, I think she was about 15 at the time. Uh, 15 or 16, and she was auditioned for the same role as Anya. And she's from Yorkshire and had the accent and just had this just 16-year-old Yorkshire farm lass vibe about her, you know, and she was absolutely brilliant. And I loved it. And Anya came in, she swanned in, and she was stunning, obviously, um, and hadn't had time to really work on the accent and all this kind of thing. And so I was like, oh, she's great, she looks amazing, but from an actor's point of view, I was like... And uh, yeah, I spoke to Rob about it afterwards, and it kind of it's obvious, isn't it? And I went, yeah, and he went, no. I was like, oh. And obviously, that's one that I was completely wrong about, in a sense, because obviously, Annie is one of the biggest movie stars in the world. Um, but yeah, um, I <laughs> my, my choice of the two for performance-wise was actually Molly Windsor. So it shows how much I, I know about this kind of stuff. It's it's an incredible performance. Obviously, you give as as William uh, in, in the film. Did it feel special uh, for you? Where at that point in your career, did you think actually? I mean, by the sounds of things, reading the script, you were like, "Oh man, I really want to do this." Um, when you're actually filming it, did you sort of go, "This is," I don't want to say game changer, but this is this is going to be a, a a real a real moment in my career. Yeah, absolutely, it did. Because I, it was spooky all the way through from getting the script. I kind of, I kind of knew it was the, the chance that I'd been waiting for for a long time to to actually, you know, get my acting chops out and do something a bit more substantial, a character that's got a, a proper journey. Um, and I didn't, I hadn't often had the chance to do that kind of thing. Mm. And I got a chance to prepare, so I lost like two and a half stone to play the part to get skinny because as soon as we cast Kate Dickey who's naturally so lean. Anyway, uh, it was like Rob kind of pointed to her and went, you've got to look like you eat the same diet. And so I was like, oh. So, <laughs> so yeah, no, <laughs> there was not a lot of beer or bread eaten for uh, for a long time and a lot of hot yoga and stuff. So, yeah, I, I really committed to it, um, loved it. It was such a an intense and brilliant experience. So Kate is, you know, one of my best friends for life. Um, I just Rob is as well. I, I saw him in in Soho last week. So yeah, it's an absolute life and career changing job. Brilliant. Did you um, did you ever ask Rob? I, I, we're going to be talking about uh, Robert Eggers and, and you working with him as we go on our journey. But did you ever actually ask him and go? You know, when this script arrived to me, I was I, I genuinely wasn't sure it was for me. Uh, where where did yeah. you see me? How how did this script end yeah. up in, in my hands? Well, the weird, thing, the weird thing is it's uh, because it was actually 
from him and his brother uh, were big fans of the UK office. And he heard my voice and he liked my voice and wanted, and wanted basically wanted my voice in it. And that's why he, he made the family from Yorkshire and, and all this kind of thing. But it was, well, he told me in a break in filming, because I said to him, he said, he said, why did this come to me? What was the link? And and he said that. And I was at that point, I was very reticent about talking about The Office. Sorry, I was just a bit bored of talking about The Office, to be honest, it had been a, a while ago. And it felt like a little bit of a millstone round your neck at that point. And then I was like, ah, but it also got me this. So all is forgiven. <laughs> so I was suddenly fine about talking about The Office again, because now I, I associate it with uh, me getting the witch. So it's fine. <laughs> That's that is that's really interesting because I, I I guess it's a real it's a double edged sword or whatever that expression is is it like you know the character in the office as 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 we're talking about it now we might as well mention Chris Finch considering like you had quite a limited amount of screen time uh, con- compared to some of the rest of the cast he is such a an often mentioned character one of the most well known characters from that series so I guess on the one hand you've gone. Well, I created this character, but on the other hand, I didn't really expect people to be like, and I'm sure this happens a lot, Finchie, et cetera, on the street. Uh-huh. Yeah, I mean, I mean, that's uh, a lot of that's down to the, the brilliant writing because he, he gets built up before you meet him and he's constantly affecting everything that's going on, even when he's not on screen. So, yeah, it's great to have a, a character like that where half the work's done for you before you actually appear on camera. <laughs> And I, I imagine I know the answer to this based on what you just said, but should they ever, ever bring it back for a special or so forth in the future? Because people often talk about it because it's such a well-respected sitcom. Um, would you ever return to that role if uh, if they were like, look, we, we need him back? Oh, hell yeah. If they got everybody back together. If they, if they got the, the cast back together, of course they would. Um, but, uh, you know, to be fair, I just can't see that happening. But, yeah, I would, definitely. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, good, good. So, far, so yeah. ultimately, it is on the fun oh, side of things. Yeah, oh, oh it does, because, I, you know, I, <laughs> I, I'm just constantly accused of hating The Office or hating my character in The Office, and it's just so not true. I just did, a, I did an interview, and I think it was, it, it came out in the sun, or this quote came out in the sun, uh, and it suggested, and basically I was saying <laughs> that Finchie was just a horrible person. And if I met him in real life, I'd hate him. And they put this thing out about Ron and said he hated his time on the office. It's like, no, that's a completely different thing. Uh, so from that, everybody's always been like, oh, I better not talk to him about the office. I'm fine. I'm very proud to have been in, in that show and it did great things for me. But yeah, people are always a bit like, oh, shit. Like, it's really not the, not the case. Yeah, I think I, I, I think, I don't know that there's many people who would go, Chris Chris Finch was a lovely, lovely man. I, I, I <laughs> yeah. But there, are, but there are people who go, "Oh no, he's really funny." No, he's just, just fucking right crap. We love to have a beer with him. You're like, would you though? Really? That says a lot about you. You know, <laughs> not about me as an actor. That says a lot about you as a person. <laughs> oh. That is, that's, people should use that as a test. Uh, what are your thoughts on, on Chris Finch? Oh, I love him. I want to, I want to, I'd love to have a beer with him. Right. Well, goodbye then. Lovely to meet yeah. you. Would you, would you, would you have a pint with Chris Finch? That's all you need to ask. I'll <laughs> sort um, the week from the chaff. <laughs> um, Ralph, we're going to talk more about uh, your career as we go on our journey today because it is time to leave this reality and enter a dimension of pure film where your virtual cinema awaits. You are our guide. We are your audience. Ralph, let's go on your trip to the movies. So we push open the doors to our temple of film and find ourselves in the foyer. There's an excited buzz that there always is in a cinema foyer, the hum of anticipation. It's your perfect cinema trip, Ralph. Who have you picked, living or dead, to go with you? I've picked the aforementioned Kate Dickey, who is one of the best actors I've ever worked with and a really cool mate. So we'd have a really nice night. <laughs> She uh, she is incredible. I mean, the the pair of you together um, in the witch was that your first time working together? Yeah, yeah. We've um, uh, we had a really really weird spiritual moment. Uh, 
when she came into the castings we were talking about before, she came in and there was uh, and a fantastic Irish actress uh, was was reading for the part. Uh, again, they were both brilliant. But we we kind of recreated the scene where they find the plot of land that they're going to build, down, and all the family kind of kneel down and clasp hands and pray. And so we kind of created that moment, and <laughs> the moment me and Kate clasped hands, it was you know like fucking hell. The the kind of energy and everything was really mad. Um, yeah, so I kind of knew immediately that that was that was something special. And she's incredible, and she taught me so much over the period of working with her on on the witch uh, going forward. She's amazing. And obviously, I've worked with her on the the Green Knight as well, which was which is fantastic. Yeah, yes, and uh, I mean you've got quite a fair few films um, together, like you say, The Witch, uh, The Northman. Uh, you're both in yeah. uh, Robert Eggers yeah. and Northman. Uh, you mentioned the Green Knight, and weirdly, which is this is just weird. You both play uh, first officer, first order officers in the. <laughs> yeah. We do, yes. Although. Uh... Like eighty percent of my already very small part was left on the cutting room floor. I think you can see it in some kind of DVD extras. Yeah, uh, Kate's in it a little more, little bit more than I am. But yeah, we uh, we're inseparable in the cinema world. Apparently, <laughs> did, did you ever speak about that? Were you like, is this weird? Is this? Uh, did they see the witch and go, oh, we'll get the couple from the witch back together? I just, I think if you're in a certain zone of casting. If you like Kate, you like me, and vice versa, kind of thing. Maybe that's it. Um, I don't know. You have to ask David Lowry or <laughs> the people who, who cast us after. But yeah, I think maybe if, if you like those kind of faces, maybe. Mm. I don't, um, yeah. I, 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 you, I, as you said, yeah. So there was a whole big scene from the the Last Jedi that was cut that you were a part of, wasn't there? It was a chase through the Star Destroyer with Finn, John Boyega's character. And, yeah, um, I had my own troop of stormtroopers. Everything I had a little, I had a little droid called BB-8, a bit like black BB-8, buzzing around next to me. Twenty-five stormtroopers behind me. I was like. I was born in uh, in '69, so I was seven years old when the first Star Wars came out. So, you know, I was right in the center of that demographic to be completely blown away by it and have all the toys and all of that stuff. My my son was the right age when the the last lot came out, the the second bunch. He's 25 now, so I got to go through it all again when those films were made, and then get to you know, just have a couple of weeks running around a set at Pinewoods um, was just brilliant. Even though I was cut from the movie, I, I don't regret it for a second. It was just just going in with a massive grin on your face every day, you know, putting my big you know, Nazi boots on and getting all the stuff on. It's you know, awesome. That's, I can't believe you had. I can't. I mean, that I can't believe they they cut you and a black BB-8 evil droid. That's that's the kind of thing that sounds awesome. Yeah, it was just too awesome, yeah. But, you know, <laughs> Ryan Johnson, you know, he made his choices. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And your son, so his, his generation was the, the, the prequels, so the, the episode, yeah. you know, and the Phantom Menace and all that. So I'm, yeah. I'm guessing because for, for that generation, that that is some of their favourite Star Wars movies because it's the ones they grew up yeah. with. Are they his favourites? Yeah, they are. Yeah. Um, bizarrely, and it's... You, kind of go oh, really <laughs> really but yeah no they are genuinely <laughs> follow your views um, it's it, i guess i guess now's the best time to mention it because it's it's quite incredible and you have had um have parts you're one of like the very few actors on the planet it's there's a handful maybe two or three i think um who have been in star wars harry potter and the marvel cinematic universe yeah, the top three grossing franchises. Yeah, right. me, me, uh, me, and Natalie Tenner. Apparently, she's recently just done something Marvel, so she's now dethroned me as the only person who who who'd been in all three. But yeah, <laughs> so it's kind of when you consider the size of the relative parts in those movies, it's kind of pathetic to be claiming it. But uh, but yes, I was on the call sheet for three of all the three biggest grossing film franchises of all time 
That's still pretty cool, though. I mean, like, yeah. you, you, I, I, I mean, I think that's cool. Yeah, yeah, but you know, as as an actor, you those aren't the parts you want to play. <laughs> you know, you want to replay yeah, the, the, the better parts. So it's hard for you know, I'm not nerdy enough to get true joy out of that. Out of the fact that I'm those three things, you know what I mean? Did, okay, I get, I get you. Yeah, I, did, I, did you have a favourite of the three? What was what was more fun to be involved in, Harry Potter, Star Wars, or the MCU? All three were actually a great laugh to film, but uh, again, because of the age of my kids, when I was doing Harry Potter, uh, that was probably the, the most fun. Coming back from work and telling them about working on Harry Potter and things that was that was fun. So yeah, I'll go with Potter. Harry Potter is uh, Amicus Caro. Yeah, good, good, buddy. yeah, good, buddy. Yeah, cool. um, right, there's a clock on the wall in the foyer, Ralph. It reads a specific time. What time of day are we going to the cinema? 6 p.m. Nice. So, um, plenty of time to have something to eat, have a few drinks, and discuss after the film. Oh. I love that. I love that. The chat afterwards is almost as fun as the film itself. Yeah, absolutely. Is it the, uh, the line from True Romance about watching movies and eating pie? Oh, I can't remember now. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to pull it up. Uh, the <laughs> movie, true, true, true Romance. And she has the thing with Christian Slater about she loves watching movies and eating pie and talking about it afterwards. Yeah. yeah. I digress. Yeah, it's good. Favorite? Do, do you have do you, do you have a, a cinema that you go to? It's like, do you have a local cinema and and your favorite local place to go to and have that uh, that experience? I guess. I mean, looking at your CV, <laughs> you're never not working. Yeah, I do. I tend to watch go to the cinema more uh, when I'm away working. You know, and um, when I'm in different countries and stuff. Uh, when I'm at home, you know, life's quite busy. So I don't often go to the to the cinema when I'm at home, but uh, yeah, when I'm away. I'd... Six p.m. It is. We're going at six p.m. to build in time for a nice beer and a chat afterwards. Okay, you booked the tickets for this trip, Ralph. Thank you very much. Uh, where in the auditorium are we going to be sitting? I think right in the middle on the back row. I just I part of it's. I'm not a huge fan of people sitting behind me, uh, but also I'm quite tall and I'm quite fidgety. So I always feel a bit guilty about the fact that someone's going to have a head moving side to side in front of them. So I prefer to be at the back, keep my way, keep myself out of it. I really, I, I understand that at some point I'm probably going to ask a, a professional from my end exactly what, what that says about me. The fact that I don't like people behind me either. I don't mm. know. I mean, we have the similarity of Leeds. Perhaps cinema in the north were particularly dangerous when we were growing up. Maybe they were. I don't know. There's some deep buried trauma of getting popcorn on the back of our heads as kids or something. I don't know. Yeah. But, yeah, but I, I like I like your seat choices. Right, we're going to sit in the middle at the back. The final thing we need before we leave the foyer. Oh, the air is full of wonderful smells. All manner of snacks and foodstuffs are available at the various counters. What are you choosing to eat? Boringly, salted popcorn. You know, that's just, I'm not, I don't particularly have a sweet tooth. Um, and I quite like salted popcorn. Yeah, that's uh, that's the correct answer. It's the classic order. I, I, I'm going to ask just because mm. obviously this is this is a, a virtual cinema of dreams. I can't tempt you with a hot dog, some pizza, nachos. Occasionally a hot dog. Occasionally a hot dog. Yeah, that would be my second two if I'm particularly hungry. But uh, yeah, no, I kind of I do like to go to the cinema and then eat afterwards. If, it, if we're talking the ideal night, so I'm not going to actually film myself up with a lot of pick and mix or nachos or anything like that. Salt and popcorn, it is. Anything to drink. You can have anything you like. Oh, I'll go with a beer. Nice. Yeah, um, nice, nice lager. Um, a a nice lager? Okay. Light Itali nice, like, kind of Italian. Yeah, something fresh. Peretti or something like that. Mm. All right, that's good. No, not a bitter, man, because we obviously grew up, uh, well, I say grew up. Leeds famously had the, the yeah. brewery. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I always used to drink uh, bitter before I moved down to London. But um, I think if you grow up uh, drinking beer that's pulled through a, um, what would you call it, sparkler, uh, to put a head on it, if that's the way you're used to drinking bitter, the way it's served down south without the sparkler, pretty flat, just looks like a really bad pint. And it just, however, however much the beer might be exactly the same beer, because it hasn't had the air put through it and it doesn't have a head, my brain just says that's a really bad pint. So years years ago, I started drinking lager in Guinness um, because can't drink the beer down south, which makes it sound like a terrible cliche northerner, but it's true. <laughs> I, well, I remember when I years ago. So this is the naughty. So this is still before all the fancy lagers came along. It, it, like, it was pretty much you'd have you know Carling and Foster's were the only two lagers on tap. And I went to Amsterdam and had a, a Dutch beer for the first time, and it was like this epiphany. Like it was cold <laughs> and actually fizzy, and, and not like the lager that we were getting in UK pubs at that point. Yeah, yeah. No, we uh, we have caught up considerably, thankfully. We have. We have. Right. On that note, let's leave the foyer. We push open the doors to the corridor down towards the auditorium. Now it's looking a little bare at the moment, so I'm going to put up posters along the wall to illustrate some of your most important movie memories. And the first poster I'm putting up depicts your fondest movie memory. I think it's got to be my very first visit to the cinema, uh, which was Malton Cinema, it's a little market town in North Yorkshire. Uh, and it was to see uh, Disney's The Jungle Book, um, which it was just amazing. Loved it, still do. Um, and just the, the whole experience of the room, the lights, the fire, just every, everything about it was immediately magical. And uh, yeah, still loved it. Still love the movie. The whole the whole ceremony around visiting a cinema to watch a film, mm. it, it is part of the experience, isn't it? Mm. Oh, absolutely, yeah. And especially as a kid, it was just, you know, it's, it, it, I equated to the first time you go to a football match as a kid. It's just such a visceral experience, everything about it. And I think it's the same thing the first time you get taken to the cinema as a kid. I hope it is um, for kids these days. It certainly was when I was a kid. And I hope, I hope kids still get that same experience of that, that buzz. And The Jungle Book, what a movie to start to your cinema going mm. uh, life with. I, I remember first time I saw that, that bit at the end where you think Baloo might be dead was heartbreaking. <sighs> oh, oh, yeah, no, trauma, trauma-inducing stuff. But that was what a wonderful, wonderful film. Wonderful film. And at one point, almost... Uh, Nearly had the Beatles in it. Those vultures at the end in that scene. I think yeah. they were they were meant to be the Beatles, weren't they? I think that if they weren't, there's something really odd <laughs> because it was that, but it was just that that really bizarre accent that the Beatles did that wasn't you know actually a Liverpool accent of any kind that you could recognise. But yeah, and the the vultures yeah just sounded like some Americans doing the Beatles Liverpool accent. But yeah, I didn't know this as a kid. I thought it was brilliant. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, right then, let's move on down the corridor and put up our next poster. So this poster depicts your worst movie memory. <laughs> ah. <laughs> yeah, um, I wrote these answers on the tube the other day, and uh, kind of immediately <laughs> after I sent them, I kind of regretted this one. <laughs> but uh, so what, what, what time is it? It's about, it's pretty safe, about three o'clock in the afternoon. Sorry if anybody's having their lunch. Um, this was uh, when The Northman, Rob Eggers' third film, came out, and I was working in Bangkok when all the premieres and everything were on, so I missed it all. So when I got back to London, uh, me and my wife went out. Had a, again, you see, I should have eaten after the film. Uh, we went out and had a Brazilian steak, kind of. Um, meal and this Brazilian steakhouse. I'm not going to say which steakhouse or which cinema because it would be obvious which steakhouse it is. But we <laughs> ate it, sat down for the film, watched the trailers, so excited. You know, this is my, my mate's first massive blockbuster movie that, you know, I've been working on and my daughter's in it, Kate's in it. It's like, oh, this is going to so excited. And then um, it turns out 
it turns into the scene from Bridesmaids, uh, where Melissa McCarthy is sat on the, on the sink going, it's coming out of me like lava. I had the worst <laughs> food poisoning I think I've ever had in my life. But I was so determined to see this film. So I was running back and forward to the toilet, back and in and back and in. And my wife's just going, what, can we not just go home? We'll watch it another time. And I'm going, I am going to watch this fucking movie. <laughs> so I didn't like ill. And I'd, I'd lost half my body weight by the time of that final credits rolled. I'd missed my own scenes. I'd missed my daughter's scenes. I'd missed like three quarters of the movie, basically. <laughs> so I've never actually been back to see it on a big screen. So I've only ever seen it on a TV. But yeah, that was pretty much my worst one. Man, uh, did I mean, did you work out what you'd had, but your wife hadn't had? Because she was fine, right? Yeah, yeah, she was fine. Yeah, no, I think it was chicken livers. Oh, no, chicken hearts, isn't it? Yeah, the chicken hearts. Oh, yeah. She didn't fancy them. I think that was the only thing that was different. But um, yeah, that really uh, wasn't a great one. I I appreciate you sharing <laughs> that with me. That's <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 as a film fan, I both appreciate your effort to stay in the cinema, <laughs> but yeah. I mean, I don't know that I'd have I'd have made it that long. Even though even though the Northman is spectacular, and like I mean, in terms of all the movies to see on the big screen, I don't want to make it worse. That's the one as well, isn't it? The yeah, screen. exactly. That was the thing, yeah. I was really enjoying the little kind of five-minute segments that I got to see of it. Oh, uh, it it's, <laughs> it's an incredible film, obviously, The Northman. I mean, much like uh, The Witch does, uh, like the, the Lighthouse does, like it immerses you so completely in the world. Like you lose <clears> yourself <throat> in it. Like Robert Eggers' films are so uh, immersive. And obviously, like, there's so many returning cast, like Anya Taylor-Joy, Kate Dickey, yourself, uh, Willem Dafoe. That that loyalty that he seems to have to, like, the actors who he's worked with, that's that's uh, that's kind of uncommon in, in the movie world. You don't see that every day, do you? Not at all, but I think that um, all your, your really good directors, director-writers... Um, I mean, broadly call it auteurs or whatever, that, they, those kind of directors, they all seem to have a kind of stable of the kind of actors that, that they like. Um, you know, Jorge Langsamos, um, you know, the Coins, uh, all these directors, they all seem to have a stable of actors that they, they like. And I think that with directors like that who are in complete control of their projects, um, you know, the filmmakers, the, you can... You can throw yourself into to working with them. You can trust them implicitly because they are just so good that it, it gives it, it makes you work on a different plane. I think because of the the trust you have with the director and some actors like to put themselves completely in the hands of a filmmaker, and others like to be more in control of the process. And I'm I'm kind of I mean the former I think because I see myself as a as a part of this massive process that gets a director's vision onto the screen. And it involves thousands and thousands of people, including the actors. So, um, yeah, so I think, I hope that certain directors recognise that kind of thing, which I think Rob does. You know, it's like he demands a very specific type of performance and and it's a very demanding way of making films, the way he does it. Uh, but I love it. It's wonderful. It's exciting. And... Um, yeah, I just yeah, I say this. Uh, I think that maybe the way that those kind of directors have that stable of actors is because they're the kind of actors who want to work in that way. Yeah, and yeah. It, it gives you a, a shorthand that you don't have if it's the first time you're working with someone. You know, I've just done my third film with with Rob Eggers, and hardly I would hardly speak to him day on day because it's kind of I know what you want. You know, I want it's. It's kind of becomes almost un unspoken at times. You don't really need a lot of direction because you've you kind of understand what they want. Yeah. And I guess also in terms of the fam familiarity, I mean, having having been on on, on, on film sets myself to, to to watch the process, I, I it, it strikes me like how nerve wracking it can sometimes be, especially if the role is quite an exposing role and you're going places with 
that role, like, it must be quite a nerve-wracking experience stepping onto a set, which that's removed when you know the director and, I'm imagining, a fair few of the crew and the cast as well. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it does. I mean, it's the long days filming. You spend a, a long time in each other's company. And so to be working with people who've got the same kind of creative drive as you, um, yeah, it's really exciting. And, yeah, stepping onto to set can be utterly terrifying because you know that when all said and done it's it's up to you to hit your marks and say the lines to make all this amazing work that the, the costumes the set design the, the director of photography you know, every just all this everybody's work has gone into this moment and sometimes you do sit there and go oh. <laughs> these are incredibly talented people who've done all this work and i keep tripping up over that same syllable with the same line and you're like no oh. so yeah but it's, uh, it is great to to the track. It, you you mentioned uh, working with uh, with great directors, of course. Robert Eggers is one. Uh, another great director you have worked with is um, a legend of cinema, no less, uh, Mr. Steven Spielberg uh, on Ready Player One. It, it, I'm, I'm guessing mm. here, but it's safe to say you were a fan before you worked with him. Yes, just a bit. Yeah, I mean, how can you not be? <laughs> you know, he's the godfather of cinema. I don't know what what you'd how you describe him, but whatever the the top accolade is, that's him. So, yeah, it's just incredible to uh, to be asked to work with him. And what was he like on set? Because obviously it's, it's, a, it's a huge movie. Your scenes that you share um, where he's directing, they're, they're slightly more intimate in terms of their mm. character scenes as opposed to, you know, the, yeah. the, the, the big action scenes. What, what, what was he like uh, in those scenes directing you? It was amazing because the it was a very small set. It was a caravan. We were kind of living in a in a caravan. So there was uh, the dolly, the the grip, and the cameraman, and the boom operator, and then the three three of us actors in the scene. So there wasn't room for anybody else to be in there. Uh, so he was just outside the caravan, at, you know, at uh, monitors, much on the monitor, and he'd kind of pop in and out um, with a note every now and again. And, <laughs> <laughs> I was there and we were um Mr. Dodger who plays um my girlfriend in it, or I, I play her boyfriend. Uh we stood there and we suddenly realised with uh, with horror that we had exactly the same thing. Is that Steven Spielberg comes to you and you've met him and however many times you meet him, you can't help but your brain's going, That's Steven Spielberg. Steven Spielberg's talking to me. That and your brain's just kind of going that, and you don't hear anything he says, <laughs> <laughs> so, and you think you think you get over it. But so I'm there on set, and he comes in and he goes, mm, "Gives me this this note, and walks away." I look, I look and I go, "What did he say?" And she went, "Oh no, and I went, "Oh no, thank you." And she goes, "Don't worry, I do exactly the same thing." So let's just hear each other's notes. So every time <laughs> you kind of nod and you go, "Yeah, absolutely, yeah, great." walk away and we'd have to give each other the note from Spielberg because you just can't help but go. Because the face, just the beard, the glasses, the just everything about it is kind of iconic. Um, more so than any actor I can think of, you know, as far as being stage struck or star struck. It was, yeah. it was an incredible thing. But he was absolutely such a nice guy and um, was so warm with my daughter visited set one day. And he gave her her own cans and sat her next to him on the uh, video village. And it turns out there was a, a, a point in this in the movie where I come out of my bedroom with my hands down my crotch, scratching my nuts before I say my line. It wasn't scripted or anything. So I you know, chucked it in because my guy was a horrible slob. So I come out and done it. And uh, my daughter, who was about maybe 12 maybe at the time, uh, was sat at the monitor next to Spielberg. And he comes in and goes, uh, goes, oh, that thing, um, you're scratching. And I'm like, yeah. Uh, and he goes, your daughter doesn't like it. <laughs> All right. Okay. <laughs> but do you like it? He went, yeah, I think it's great. Keep it in. And I was just like, she's just going to mock her own like, what, what reality am I in mean, here? Am I taking notes from my daughter through Steven Spielberg? No, thankfully that's not happening. He was just messing with me. But, uh, Oh really? Yeah, That's good. so funny. I thought for a moment your daughter had literally like tapped him on the shoulder and go, Stephen, quick note. Um the whole uh, scratching the crotch thing, I think we need to lose that. <laughs> it, 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 I think that is almost what happened. 
because I think he turned he turns around and he probably just turned around and goes, "Hey, what do you think?" And she, and she probably went, "I don't like him scratching his nut," <laughs> because she's like that. And she's she's confident and would speak her mind. So that's probably how it went. And then he came in and went, "Oh, by the way, your daughter hates the nut scratching." But I, you know. uh, brilliant, brilliant. Yeah. Um, Right then, we need to put up another poster as we continue down this corridor. And this third poster depicts the last performance that brought you to tears. <laughs> um, I just put up um, <laughs> "See Above," which was in <laughs> reference to, in reference to my Northman experience. Uh, I, I don't know. I'm a, I'm a bit of a crier all round. Anything uh, inspirational, uh, sports movies stuff like that i'm just rubbish i cry at them so easily toy story uh really good kids animations i, yeah, I can go on i'm quite a crier in films oh, yeah i get that because you're a you're a, i'm not really a big sports fan in real life but a sports drama gets me like nothing mm. else that final throw of the 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 football, if it's an american football movie that makes the mm. touchdown in the last sec dying seconds of a game yeah. it just gets me yeah yeah Oh, it's great drama. Right then. So, is there a particular sports movie? Let's stick with sports. I need to put up a poster. What what, what sports movie shall we, we put up as a poster? Is there one that really got you in your throat there? You can feel it. Uh, I think it comes out la- up later in these questions. Oh, okay. uh, but I, I okay. yeah. Oh, yeah. But yeah. We'll keep it a secret. Uh, I will put up okay. a generic sports movie poster and we've reached our final poster which depicts Ralph your unpopular movie opinion um I don't know whether this is an age thing or a a tall bloke with a bad back thing but I just think if a film's over two hours you should have a 10 minute interval just to be able to walk around I need I didn't need to do it just to stretch my back out I can't sit still for that for, for two and a half hours so, okay. Now I'm gonna just. I'm literally just gonna play devil's advocate here. So, are we saying two hours or two and a half hours? Because the Northman, for example, that's two <laughs> two hours fifteen minutes. Now, based on <laughs> how immersive it is, do you would you put an interval in that? I would, but that's for my personal appearance. Um, I know that Robert wouldn't, and most filmmakers wouldn't, but. Uh, uh, if I'm going to the cinema, I would like an interval. But I also appreciate that that is an, uh, an unpopular opinion, particularly because it's based around my own personal circumstances and probably does take you out of the movie at a very important moment. Um, but, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the the back thing, obviously. Yeah, well, that's that's more a necessity. This isn't this is even, like, uh, just like, oh, it's a whim. Like, you want to go I get up and stretch your back. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose. So I just want to be able to go, oh, can you just pause that a minute? <laughs> to the projectionist. <laughs> just kind of stretch my hips out. Yeah, yeah it's uh, it's an interesting one. I think I, I've, I've had this conversation with people because I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll, we can, we're, we're, we're friends now. I'll be honest with you. I'm a, I'm a multiple movie uh, toilet visitor because I don't know what mm-hmm. it is. I think it's now, it's reached a psychological level where my brain basically goes, oh, the movie started. I hope you don't need a wee. And I go, well, I do now. Thanks, brain. <laughs> I'm going to need yeah. a wee. So building in an interval, I am totally, totally with you. But everyone I've said this to go, the audience, when they come back from an interval, you'll have 15 minutes more rustling like you do at the start when the trailers are on, except the movie's going to be on as people are sort of getting back into the rhythm yeah. of the film, eating their popcorn. Yeah, no, you're right. Uh, it was a really rubbish opinion. <laughs> Not just an unpopular opinion. Uh, yeah, it's a rubbish one. I, sh- I should just have to miss the odd five minutes of a movie. It's shouldn't make everybody one. else suffer for me. <laughs> I'm putting up a big poster with the word interval on as your unpopular movie opinion. Right, so we, we've reached the auditorium. Uh, now, we push open this final set of doors. There is a queue of people hoping to join you and Kate Dickey in the cinema to watch this film that you're going to be playing for us. Do you want to let them in? Do you like a busy communal cinema experience or do you want it just yourself and Kate? Would... Uh, oh, ha, ha. Hmm. You a communal cinema fan? Do you like Yeah, I mean, it, it could... 
Yeah, it depends on the on the on the on the film, really. Uh, you know, some films can be massively enhanced by watching it with a big audience. Others, you know, you just want to be completely immersed yourself and have no other uh, no other interaction, as it were, or not know that there's anybody else in the room. Uh, but yeah, I think generally, um, I would like a full, respectful audience. No phone screens on stuff like that. You know. Got you. Uh, well, I'll I'll double check uh, the behaviour of the audience as they walk past us into the auditorium. Make sure they're a they're a cinema respectful crowd. But we'll let them in. The crowd go wild. We take our seats in the middle at the back. I'm here too. You, me, Kate. Now. The first thing we're going to do before we get to the movie you've picked for us is play a trailer for the film that you are most looking forward to seeing at the cinema. What film are you looking forward to seeing at the cinema? Um, the uh, Embarrassingly, I haven't been to see Poor Things yet, uh, which director-wise and cast-wise is so up my street um, that I've kind of almost been saving it because I know I'm going to love it so much. Uh um so yeah, as yeah, anything with Willem Defoe especially. Um so yeah, I'd say poor things. We'll play the trailer for poor things. I'm not gonna be that guy because so many people go, Oh yeah, I, I'm like, don't tell me any spoilers, and then they immediately go, they prefix the sentence out of their mouth with this isn't a spoiler, but and undoubtedly yeah. it's a spoiler. Yeah. Exactly. So I'm not exactly. I'm not I've seen it, I'm not saying a word. I hope you enjoy mm -hmm. it. Right. Let's press on. The next thing we're going to play on the big screen is the movie moment that makes you literally or metaphorically pump your fist in the air. This was where the um, the sports thing uh, of the last but one question was about. Mm. And I think it's just Rocky. The original, the first Rocky. Uh, watched it as a kid. Loved it so much. And it's I mean, always been in my top ten movies. Um Rocky. Um, I, I enjoyed all the sequels as well for exactly the reasons they were made. But <laughs> the original film, uh, the original film, I think is is a masterpiece. I love it. And yeah, when he finally defeats him and does the agent, seeing that that's just like, <laughs> and I got the you know the bra the brass comes in of the of the theme tune over the top, and everybody's in the ring and all that. Yeah. I don't think you can get much better than that. It's, yeah, it's a, isn't it? It's so good as well because like he's lost, but he he showed what he can do. So he's got the fight <clears> thing, but the fact that he calls out for Adrian in that moment is like it's such a it's so beautiful as well. It's incredible, yeah, really good. It's such an amazing performance by him. He's so good in it. You know, I'm not saying that his other work is bad, but my God, it's it's in a different. It's like a different genre to, to what he's he's doing in Rocky. It's, it's weird. Brilliant. Yeah. Love it. Yeah, incredible. Right, we'll play Adrian as <laughs> the moment that makes you pump your fist in the air. Next, we're going to play what you consider, Ralph, cinema's most shocking moment. Um, yeah, it's, it's kind of a niche one, but I think it was just so, it's a moment in a film that's so well earned that, you as an audience kind of slowly realize what's going on. And it's, it's, yeah, it's a car crash in slow motion where kind of nothing happens. It's, uh, in the film, Little Miss Sunshine and, uh, Paul Dano's character, uh, it was Dano or Dano, uh, mm -hmm. uh, but his, his character, um, wants to be a pilot. He's obsessed about being a pilot. It's his, everything in his world. And at some point quite late in the film and you just, is just been doing this beautiful, beautiful, quiet, still performance the whole way through the film, but building up, building up, and then um, I'm almost kind of, almost crying thinking about it. Uh, and he, uh, and at this moment, he finds out that he's colorblind in the van, and then you realise that means he can't be a pilot. That everything's falling apart, and he just walks away from the van, and it's just like, oh my god, because it, the the moment's so well earned, and it plays out so slowly. In its own way, it's just yeah, that that was. I don't know whether it's a shocking moment, but it's, it was a real like, oh my god, that's a gut punch. 
It's uh, it, yeah, no, it it really is as well because and like you say, it has been so carefully built up to that point because he's so quiet and he doesn't like his family. You can see that him becoming this pilot is his way out of this family that he doesn't really, he's not really getting on with at that point in his life. And to have that snatched away from him. Yeah. No, it was a, uh, yeah, really heartbreaking. Brilliant. Love that film. Lovely. Lovely. Okay. Next, we're going to play through the Dolby Atmos speakers, the line or piece of dialogue from a movie that most affected you. Oh yeah, I um, there's yeah, there are there are um, many great lines, uh, and I went really self indulgent on it because, and I picked one of my own because uh, it, 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 it it was a um, it was just a very special day uh, or a couple of days on the Green Knight uh, with David Lowry and Deb Patel uh, in Ireland and. It was an amazing experience because I had these full prosthetics playing the Green Knight. I had, uh, you know, suit, suit of armor, prosthetic hands, uh, this huge kind of tree-like formation on my head that took like four hours to put on. And it was really heavy and, you know, really hard to work with in a, a, on one level, but um, really strangely transformative on another. So I walked in this huge stuff and people helping me walk one into this uh through this like forest glade to get to this real um, old abandoned chapel, which they use for the location for the Green Chapel, the Green Knight's home, has found this thing which is almost perfect. They hardly had to do anything to it, um, which was spooky in itself. And it was just near where they were shooting uh, a couple of days before. So we found this amazing location. And that day, the wild garlic had come into flower. So in this forest, it was just, the whole place had this massive um, aroma of uh, wild garlic, which isn't unpleasant. It doesn't smell like garlic. It doesn't in a sense, but it's a, it's a much more pleasant smell. And it really dense. And all my senses, kind of my sense of hearing, you couldn't hear anything. I had huge contact lenses over my eyes. And obviously all your skin's covered. It's a weird experience kind of being in this bubble as, as you walk into set. And then suddenly one thing I can do is smell. Suddenly, I got this massive waft, which just smelled like, sorry to sound like Baldrick, but smelled like pure green. You know, it's, it just, it really did. It was like, oh my God. And it, it kind of like, it triggered something. And the, the scene with Dev, uh, it's a very simple scene where he comes to me to get his head chopped off. Um, and, uh, it, it, Dev's really, really wonderful actor, just so, incredible to look at he's so beautiful and the intensity of the way he works is brilliant so it's just this incredible moment where his character's trying to let someone chop his head off it was that incredible to be working now brilliant director brilliant actor in this incredible prosthetic costume and yeah just at one point the, the scene was beautiful because he's he, he turns around and goes is this really all there is and the Green Knight turns around and goes, what else ought there be? And it's just such a simple thing. And it's just like his whole, his arse falls out. And he's just like, oh, fuck. It's just a simple line. And I, uh, I just, I love saying that. So, yeah, that's my, that's my very self-indulgent pick for that answer. Well, I don't know that it's that self-indulgent. I see why you're saying that. But it's, it's often brought up. There's a million videos of that moment on the internet and people talking mm. about that moment a lot. I love, I love the green Knight. I remember watching it. Um, I think it came out, well, did it come out in lockdown? I think it did. Uh, cause it was like, um, but... yeah, cause we were, we were supposed to do South by Southwest in 2019 or just as the COVID was kind of starting to, yeah. to affect, it was one of the first things to be, uh, to be canceled. And then he went away for a year, and I think recut it. So I think it came out in definitely in, in during lockdown. It's brilliant. I won't. I, mm. It's brilliant. I, I won't lie, and I don't think I'm too embarrassed to say that I uh, I did immediately go and look up online exactly what the ending meant because I was. <laughs> Wait, what? And it's fascinating to read about. You could write a thesis yeah. on this movie. Oh, so many people have, yeah, because it's you know it's. Um, that intellectual property that's been around since you know 1400 I think uh 
the old by an unknown author. Um, so it's been studied and picked apart and the story's been retold many, many different ways. There's lots of different interpretations of it. I, I loved what um, David Lowry did with it. I thought it was great. He told me to, um, when we did that final scene, uh, he gave me a note uh, before we did it and said, you're Santa Claus. Basically, that was it. Just went to play it like you're Santa Claus. And he went, okay. It was great. So yeah, it was it was funny that I've been this big guy who's just about to chop your head off, but doing it in a really nice way, you know, <laughs> with a smile. Oh, I love it. Um, right, mm. it's our penultimate question. Before we get to the movie you picked for us, and the final thing we're going to play in the auditorium is your favourite use of music in a film. The best use of music in a film. Now, I promised myself I was going to actually look up what the piece of music's called. It's Cavaliera Rusticana, I believe. Uh, and it's the main main theme from uh, Raging Bull. Uh, as I've already demonstrated, I, I like boxing. I think it it's made some great films over the years, uh, none better than Raging Bull. And uh, some of the the montages to that to that tune in the movie are just, you know, just make your chest swell. It's like, I'm not in any way Italian, but, you know, those moments make you feel very Italian. (laughs) It's a a beautiful score. A beautiful uh, score. Um, The main theme from Raging Bull echoes around the auditorium. And here we are, Ralph. It is now time to announce to this excited audience in this packed auditorium kate dickey and myself the movie out of all others you have picked to screen for us tonight ralph what are we watching so on this uh, on this theme of me 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 i'm, um, I'm picking uh, robert eggers's next film uh which is called nosferatu uh, which I may or may or not be in myself. Um, but I've watched, uh, Robert get this film together and the script and the idea, uh, for the best part of 10 years since I very first met him. He, he wanted to, to make this, uh, make this film. So it's an absolute passion project for him and Jaron, the DLP. Uh, and, yeah, it, we filmed it uh, kind of spring last year in Prague, uh, and it's been released on Christmas Day this year, December the twenty fifth. Um, and yeah, it's the the, the montages and the uh, the assemblies that I've seen and the, the work I've seen when I've been doing ADR. I just think it's so stunning, and it's going to be absolutely amazing. So I'm hoping it's going to be a film that. Lots of people want to show us their favourite film ever. I mean, I, I, I'm so pleased we managed to dodge talking about Nosferatu till this late in our conversation because <laughs> I, 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 I was saving up for this. This is, I'm so excited about this. It's the it's, a, it's the 1922 horror classic. That's the, the original Nosferatu. There now, <clears throat> tell me, like you mentioned, Willem Dafoe earlier. He obviously uh, plays. I did look up his name because there was no way I was going to remember. It it is uh, Professor Eberhardt von France. Thank you. Yeah, Al- Al- Albin Albin Eberhardt von France is his name. Yeah, he's a a Swiss scholar um, who uh, is is brought in to uh, try and help with uh, potentially occult happenings in Visburg, where I play um, Doctor Wilhelm Sievers who's the medical director of this book. I, I, I saw an interesting quote from um, uh, Robert Eggers saying that your character's in many ways Watson to Willem Dafoe's Holmes. Uh, mm. Tell me what it was like. You, obviously, like you said, you, you, you love Willem Dafoe's an actor. I am imagining you've shared some scenes with him in this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was an absolute joy. Uh, he's been one of my favourite actors since long before I even thought about acting as a career or a job. Um, you know, back in platoon and uh, and we'd been at, at university and watching him in um, uh, Wild at Heart and amazing movies like that. Just 
such a brilliant actor and again one of those what we were talking earlier on about great auteur directors having uh, having a stable of of good character actors and you look at Willem as in every <laughs> every stable <laughs> you know he's a kind actor he's a Wes Anderson he's Jorge Rantamos he's Rob Eggers everybody wants him because he's he's just that good and he's such a lovely fellow um, so yeah it was an absolute dream to to be a sidekick it was great I think we haven't really seen much of of um, of what what this film's going to be. I know there was a, a still that came out just before Christmas of Willem mm. Dafoe, like yeah, surrounded yeah. by fire, and Robert Eggers said, "Yeah, yeah. those are real flames." And there were two thousand real life rats in. That yeah, film. yeah, it was pretty disgusting. The smell, you, know, you imagine they're just yeah, you know, they're just there, two thousand of them, constantly pissing. And so you've got, you know, you've got flames, you've got big lan- lanterns and stuff like that. So, you know, pumping the temperature up. So, yeah, it's just a very hot, rat pissy set. Um, so, <laughs> not grim. But thankfully, we had quite big boots, you know, boots up to up to the shin. So it's not one that you'd want to, a set you'd want to be walking through with, you know, slip-on shoes or flip-flops. But, um, yeah, it's all right if you've got boots on. <sighs> Uh, yeah, um, yeah, very much looking forward to it, and I think Bill Skarsgård. Just to to end on this, I mean, what a, you know, what a great piece of casting. You sort of go, yeah, yeah, I can see him as Count Orlock. Oh yeah, when they, uh, yeah, can't wait for them to release kind of what he looks like because it's incredible. It's an incredible look that they've created, you know, makeup and costume, and um, and you know, Bill himself with doing the uh, Robert Eggers diet. I met when we we first started the film. I met up with Bill and Nick Holt and Willem, and we all we all went out for a bit of food and drink. And me and Willem having a couple of beers and a bit of pasta and all that. And the two of them are sat there with a glass of water and a small steak because <laughs> they're just on this protein. You know, not allowed to have any fat on your diet. And I sat there thinking, I'm so glad I'm finding the middle aged men in Robert Eggers' films now because <laughs> I remember doing that, and that was hard. Yeah. <laughs> Hard being skinny. And yeah. you've heard his voice as well then, Bill Skarsgård's voice, because mm. apparently he's lowered he's lowered the octave yeah, yeah. of voice he trained with an opera singer or something. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's incredible the work he put in. And the, again, the uh, playing those kind of parts, you've got to do so many hours in, in prosthetics. Uh, and then that's, it, it just makes it very, very demanding and the days are incredibly long. So, uh, yeah. Just all respect to him. He's brilliant. Well, and he was my my stars guard hat trick as well, because I worked with his dad and his brother, and now him. So I've got. We're talking about geeky collectors, you know. I've got. I've got all three stars guards. So wait, you got Alexander <laughs> from uh, from the Northmen, Stellan Skarsgård. What was it? What was it? What, what was it? I, I was in uh, Chernobyl with them. We oh were, my god! We were generals. Oh. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, got three of them now. <laughs> the the, the scars go triumvirate. Um, well, I'm I feel very privileged to be able to have uh, watched um, Nosferatu, uh, n- uh, nearly a full year ahead of its actual release. I'm 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 guessing even though we're screening it in this fantastical cinema of dreams, you haven't seen a finished cut yet, or have you? No, no, I haven't. No, no, I, uh, I'm eagerly anticipating it, and I'm promised that I'll be able to see. But no, Excellent. I haven't. Oh, well, uh, that is almost it, Ralph. Uh, the guests are milling out now as the curtains close on Nosferatu, to smiling, chatting, and thanking you for taking them on an incredible night out of the pictures. But before we go, it is our final question where we ask you to tell us an exclusive, never-before-heard story about your career, past, present, or future. Um... <laughs> This kind of got stymied because my answer was uh, rejected by uh, my agent because it was about um, a project I'm going to do in March. Uh, and I was going to say that, uh, but <laughs> all I, no, okay. yeah, I, can't, I can't really answer. All I can say is that I'm, I'm continuing down the gothic horror line in March. But, you know. That's, that's that's all I could basically say. So it's, it's a pretty rubbish answer to that one. Um, that's all right. That's yeah, all right. So you've yeah. got you. This is a movie you're starting filming on. Yeah, yeah. I'll start okay. that. Uh, yeah, in, in March. Yeah. So, okay. So this but, isn't uh, this isn't this isn't the first omen because I know you've got that coming out in April. Mm, 
Yeah, in April. Yeah, that comes out in April. So yeah, I've just been doing some um, some ADR work on that and uh, watching bits of it. It looks absolutely fantastic. So That's very great. excited about playing, that coming out. You're playing Father Brennan, so you're playing the the role that Patrick Troughton so famously played yeah. in the original. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and Pete Bosselthwaite, um, who's also a, a big hero of mine as an actor, he played it in the remake that they did in 2006. Uh, so yeah, to uh, both of them, um, amazing, amazing actors. So uh, yeah, to take that on, I play him six years younger uh, when he's kind of not quite as crazy as he is in the original movie. Is there's a, a descent to get to um, where where Father Brennan is when he dies in the original 1976 movie. So um, yeah, this is the story leading up to that. So. Interesting, interesting. Mm. Yeah, well, that's good because as much as I love uh, Patrick Troughton's performance and the original Omen, the bit where he goes into Gregory Peck's office to try and convince him that that, that something is afoot and the devil is doing mm. his work, he's too crazy. Like, if I was yeah. Gregory Peck in that scene, I'd be like, "No, I'd, I'm not going to listen to you." He needed to dial it down. Yeah, yeah, and I think that this is it. Um, it's uh, if you dial it down a lot. And you, you go back to when he was you know, much more together, and the Antichrist had not been born. Um, you know, there was still something to going on to. So uh, yeah, I think he's a uh, he's not quite as swivel eyed in the in the first omen as he is by the end of the omen. Oh, Ralph, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Your taxi has arrived to ferry you back to reality. So all that's left for me to do is say thank you so much and have you had a good time? I've had a great time. It's been lovely. Thank you. Thank you Mom. so much for watching this interview. Um, I'd love it if you would check out some of the other interviews on our channel. They're all fascinating and unique trips to the movies with some wonderful, wonderful guests. And if you would like to find out more, do hit us up on our social channels. We are at Trip to Movies Pod. That's at Trip to Movies Pod on all social media with lovely content on there. And you can get in touch with us if you so wish. Thanks again.